and gentlemen, to episode number 31 of Let's Go Racing with David Starr. Tyler Jones here with you. So glad to have you with us. Coming up on today's show, we're going to be joined by NASCAR Truck Series driver Spencer Boyd. But before we bring Spencer in, a reminder that the folks at Whataburger cook up 100% pure beef burgers 24 hours a day. You can get your burger fix anytime, day or night at Whataburger. Proud to serve it hot and fresh. 24 hours a day. David Starr joins us right now. David, how are we doing after the Atlanta race weekend? Man, we're doing great. It was uh, it was an exciting weekend, that's for sure. A lot to talk about there, but uh, we'll cover that. I want to bring Spencer Boyd in because I'm excited to hear what he's got to say about his news, but uh, we'll cover Atlanta, man. There's a lot to talk about from the Xfinity race and the Cup race, and uh, uh, but I, right now we're going to pause and bring Spencer in here in a second. Spencer, uh, how we doing, man? I'm good, man. Happy to be here. What about you, boys? Doing great. Doing great. Dominic Oregon of the RacingExperts.com is here as well. Dominic, tell us a little bit about Spencer. Hey, everybody. Yes, yeah, Spencer joining the show. Let's go racing with David Starr this evening. He's a 2019 Truck Series winner at Talladega Super Speedway. He's run races in all three of NASCAR's National Touring Series. Spencer, we really appreciate you taking the time to come join us here last minute at Let's Go Racing. Absolutely, man. Uh, anytime I can talk race, and I love it. And uh, I'm excited to be back in the Xfinity Garage this week, and I'll see you out there, David. Hey, we're, we're excited to have you, man. It's, uh, man, I've always been a big fan of yours, and uh, especially three, you know, two, three, I don't know, four years ago when you're racing full time in the Xfinity Series, driving for Bobby, Bob, Bobby Daughter. I mean, you did a hell of a job then, and, uh, you know, I hated to see you jump over to the truck side, but man, I love truck racing too. I did it forever, 16, 17 years. And uh, man, to see Spencer Boyd pull into victory lane at Talladega last year, uh, uh, whenever, I think it was last year, it might've been the year before, but man, that was, that was exciting. And then to back it up at Daytona, there's been three or four times where I was on my freaking jumping up and down, telling you how to drive from afar, man, but you, uh, Man, you, uh, you did yourself, your team, your sponsors, and all your fans proud. I mean, anytime you can pull into victory lane in any NASCAR series, I mean, it says a lot about your ability and the talent you have and the team you're driving for. So, dude, uh, looking back on it, man, that was it was unbelievable, wasn't it? Thank you, buddy. It's, uh, you know, dream come true. I relived that moment, uh, Talladega. That was so big for Young's Motorsports and myself and – uh, I honestly think about it every day, and then you get that little taste of a win. You know the deal, and you just want to race as much as you can and, and do as good as you can and try and get back in that situation again. And uh, Super Speedways have done me really well, uh, but excited. New Hampshire this coming weekend. I can't believe I haven't been in, a, in an Xfinity car since 2018, so time sure does fly by. Well, man, so tell us about that, uh, getting in the Xfinity car, racing for Jimmy Means, I believe it is, uh, in the Xfinity series. Uh, what's your expectations heading into this weekend there in New Hampshire, uh, Spencer? Yeah, I tell you, it's, uh, you know, one of those deals where I've driven for so many great car owners in NASCAR, uh, you know, six years ago, I got my start, Mike Mittler, I've driven for Rick Ware, Bobby Daughter, obviously Young's Motorsports, so many different people along the way. And uh, checking another one off the list there with Jimmy Means. I mean, big powerhouse name in the sport. Been around a long time. Uh, this deal kind of came together late. New Hampshire is one of my favorite tracks. Uh, haven't been there in a couple of years since Xfinity Racing. Uh, Freedom Warranty, big partner of mine. Um, we had a rough go of it at Coda. So looking to uh, do a better, better job for them this weekend here at New Hampshire. And it's close to their home base. So. Uh, freedom warranty, extended car warranties. Uh, they're not the ones calling you, hounding you all the time. So check them out online. Uh, but we got a really cool patriotic paint scheme uh, rolling out at New Hampshire Motor Speedway. That's awesome, Spencer. And when you look at this race weekend, is this going to be a one race deal for you, at Jimmy Means, or is this have the potential to turn into some more races in 2021? I tell you, man. Uh, last couple of years have always been uh, weird, wild, and crazy. So you never know. Uh, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but. Um, really excited you know one-off deal here have a good time and uh, go out there and do a good job for jimmy try and uh, get some points and i tell you i've been hanging out at the shop with him the last couple days and those guys work really hard grassroots guys i'm sure david can speak highly of those guys um but really as a race car driver you're just looking for every chance you can to get on the racetrack and this is another one 
So when you climb out of that race car on Saturday, what's going to make a successful race weekend, not only for you, but for the team as well? Yeah, you know, hey, finishing the race is uh, key. You know, uh, to get a good finish, you got to finish the race. So uh, I know the boys are working hard on the car. Uh, swung by there today to make sure the seat and everything's fitted. Uh, I tell you, all my stuff is locked and loaded at Young's Motorsports in the 20 truck. Uh, so this deal, you know, somebody else's seat, we're, we're making it all work and happen. Uh, but obviously my partner, Freedom Warranty, on board, and uh, the car looks really good. So if we can go out there, get a top 30, get Jimmy some points, uh, bring the car home one piece, uh, I think you guys know what my job is. And uh, I'm going to have a really good time doing it. The fans at New Hampshire Motor Speedway, it's been a couple years for me. Uh, they're great folks up there. So I'm excited to go cruise the campground, high five, and uh, just be back at another racetrack with a sold-out crowd. What challenges, uh, Spencer, does uh, New Hampshire present? Well, you know, I was looking through my notes, and uh, it's funny that David called me here. Uh, my notes actually have my notes and talking to David Starr next to him. Uh, so we were teammates a couple years ago, and uh, obviously from my notes I could tell he was driving into the one cone. I was lifting at the two cones, so this is back in 2017. Uh, so I'm like, man, I got to get up on the wheel this time. Uh, PJ1, it's always going to be a curveball. Um, I've seen in the past at New Hampshire, they put it on the bottom and the top, but the middle's open. Uh, so just, you know, no practice, no qualifying, get out there. And, and at the end of the day, I'm, I'm starting 40th. So uh, we got a long way to go uh, to get to a good finish. But at the end of the day, I'm going to get to see a lot of people slide in there and turn one and kind of judge what I need to do. Well, well, Spencer, man, I've, I've raced with you for a long time and, and, uh, you do a hell of a job. It's fun to watch you week in and week out in the truck series, and uh, it's exciting to see you back, back, in, back in the Xfinity series with uh, my good friend and legendary Jimmy Means. And, I mean, I think that's just a, a great fit right there. But, uh, but man, you, you've done a great job. Our listeners, they don't understand. Spencer Boyd's a great race car driver, but the, but the uh, your ability and your want to – is very inspirational that people that know you, like I know you. And, man, you're probably one of the hardest working race car drivers out there. And, and it, you know, it takes so much more than this it, to be in NASCAR, Truck Series, Xfinity Series, the Cup Series like you've done over the years. People don't realize how hard that is just because you're a very, very talented race car driver doesn't mean you're going to be there uh, year eight sponsors you have on your truck and man you're you're one of those guys I don't believe that there's any other race car driver out there that really does what you do for your partners you bring these these companies in you introduce them to and you make sure that they get a return on their investment and man to, to be a guy that did, does all that on his own and to race at the level you race at, man, it's really cool to have seen you develop as a great race car driver over the years. But it's cool to see what you do on and off the racetrack. And, man, that's a big part of it because, you know, I don't think yourself, I don't think you come from a family that's got unlimited dollars. I don't. I know you don't. Uh, there's some others that we race with, a lot of others that do. But, uh, but we got to make sure we got great partners so we can keep racing year after year. And, man, you have just, just done a fabulous job. I'm always amazed to see all the different partners you have. And it's cool to see what you do week in and week out, man. You should be proud of yourself. Well, thank you, man. Uh, David, you, you've you been around a long time. You know how this deal works. And uh, sometimes uh, it's it's hard to explain to fans. It's and, and it's really, you know, it's not up to them to understand all the ins and outs of it. Um, at the end of the day, we just want them to support our efforts and our partners. And, for me, you know, looking at guys like you, you've had Whataburger in here for so long. And I talk about that to my partners. I'm like, this is a marketing strategy that has to be more than 12 months. You know, you have to buy into this. We have to do this on multiple levels. It's not just stickers on the car, right? It's it's podcast. It's the branding. It's the hospitality. You know it. Um, you and I have had many conversations back uh, 2017, 2018. I was 21, 22 years old. And now I'm 26 and uh, just trying to take all that knowledge I've learned from guys like you. Um, to be in this sport this long, I feel really blessed, really fortunate. Um, and, you know, not everyone agrees with your decisions that you make. 
Um, that's always going to happen. I saw that on Twitter today, and I'm like, man, I'm just a guy happy to be going to the racetrack. Uh, I don't care if I got to drive 14 hours to New Hampshire to do it. So uh, we've all been through that, uh, down that road, um, but it's going to be fun. And I uh, appreciate uh, the shout out on my partners and stuff. Uh, it takes a lot to make this deal happen. And uh, after Coda, really looking forward to getting a good run for Freedom Warranty. Um, it's been a tough year. Missed a couple races there. So uh, trying to get the ball rolling in the right direction. Spencer, a couple more things, and then we'll uh, let you run because we know you you got to go here. But uh, back on the truck series side, uh, you know th this year seems like uh, John Hunter Nemechek's kind of led the way with with five wins, really doing a good job. Ben Rhodes up there as well with two wins. Uh, for those that maybe don't watch the truck series regularly, what would you say to the folks out there about the product that you guys just as a series are putting out there with uh, these exciting races week in and week out? What would you tell folks to try to encourage them to check out what you guys are doing on trucks? Yeah, I mean, I think the Camping World Truck Series is a, a great series. I've been a part of it a while now. Um, put on a great race uh, from the front to the back. I tell people, you know, there's races going on within the races. And, and unfortunately, sometimes you got to be at the track to see that. Uh, seeing all these great fans. I mean, Pocono was unbelievable. Uh, there were so many people at that truck race. It was exciting. And touching on Pocono, obviously, John Hunter uh, picked up the win there, fifth one of the season. Great job to him. Um, he, he's a great driver. Uh, KBM is a great team. Uh, so he you got to congratulate those boys for uh, getting it done, start to finish. But realistically, tune in. Watch the Truck Series. There's a lot of young guys. There's a lot of older talent. At the end of the day, it's hard to make up for experience. So I'm out there trying to get as much as I can. But you got legendary guys in the Truck Series. Uh, Matt Kraft and Johnny Sauter, they're putting up a good fight. And you got some young guys trying to build on their career and leapfrog to the next step. So check out the Truck Series. Uh, it's always for a good show. And uh, I think you saw a great show at Knoxville, man. They tore up more stuff than a pull apart. <laughs> that, that was um, that was unbelievable, Spencer. But man, hey, man, you know you do a good job. And, and uh, like I said, hey, the fans don't realize that you know those Kyle Busch Motorsports trucks and those GMS trucks. You know, just the money, the the sponsorship, and the the resources and what they have. Uh, I'll do. I deal with it week in and week out. And I, I, I'm sure you deal with it, but uh, we're not racing on – we're not equal today, but that's okay. It's always that hope that we're going to be equal. And, man, the truck team you have and uh, what you've done with uh, with your team and all your spawn and pulling into victory lane at Talladega, dude, you, uh, you should be so proud, man. And I'm, I'm excited for you. I'm excited for this weekend for you to be in the Xfinity car with Jimmy Means, and, uh, man, I hope that turns into more races for you because uh, nobody deserves it more than Spencer Boyd, that's for sure. Thank you, buddy. It's uh, hopefully more races um, at the end of the day, just trying to get out there and do stuff. Uh, appreciate all the support these years. I'll uh, bump into you at the racetrack, uh, ask you some pointers for sure. And uh, look forward to seeing you up there. And uh, appreciate you guys having me on tonight. Yep, yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll end on this. Uh, you know, some of our biggest supporters of this show, Spencer, uh, are uh, Lori and Bob Kroger. And we have their two favorite drivers on the show <laughs> right now between you and David. So uh, special <laughs> moment to have both you guys here. I know Lori and Bob are watching. We appreciate them. And, and uh, all the support of all our listeners, uh, you know, to see – uh, guys like you, we, we love having you on the show. Welcome back anytime, Spencer. We'll have to have a more long-form conversation with you down the line. Appreciate it. All Look right. forward to seeing Lori and Bob at uh, another race. David, <laughs> I'll catch you soon, boys. All right, buddy. I'll see you in a couple of days. Thanks for jumping on with us, buddy. Have Absolutely. a good evening. You too. All right, man. There you have it. That is uh, Spencer Boyd joining us here on uh, Let's Go Racing with David Starr. And uh, we continue with the rest of this show. Uh, things a little bit different this week with uh, Spencer having to run, but that's okay. That gives us more time to touch on uh, some other things that we'd normally not get to. But, David, uh, let's start out looking back in Atlanta. I know you didn't get the result you wanted, uh, but nonetheless, uh, you, you, you started out okay, but then, uh, you know, some, uh, some things didn't go your way. Tell us about what happened there in Atlanta, David. Man, Atlanta was awesome, man. You know, we're not having any practice, no qualifying. Our uh, our Whataburger Toyota Super was, man, when they dropped the green flag, that thing was wanting to swap ends on me. It was pretty loose. 
and uh, I was trying to stay on the lead lap, and uh, you know, I was passing people on the outside, but man, it was, uh, I had to be a, ahead of the race car, meaning I knew it was what it wanted to spin out on me, but you still got to race the heck out of it. And uh, man, we, we managed to stay on the lead lap. We got the, we got the competition caution came out. We got to tighten that thing up. And man, I'll tell you what, after they tightened her up, man, I, I think I passed, I think I went from 36 or 35th or wherever we were to about 19th. I mean, that thing was just, unbelievable how good our race car was and uh unfortunately uh i uh later on in the race uh we had a pit stop we made some adjustments and uh, i had a guy i had a car pass me on the inside i didn't realize that somebody got a good run off turn four and i came up a little bit and they just barely had a bumper there and it and i hooked myself and and got turned into the wall and there's nobody to blame but myself, you know what I mean? But it's been a long time since I wrecked going straight, you know what I mean? I was on straightaway, so I a uh, little disappointed with uh, with with myself. But uh, but anyway, it's just racing. We were racing hard, but I uh, man, my Waterburger Toyota was pretty awesome, and I just uh, wish we could have finished the whole race because I really thought we we're gonna have a great race, and man, it just. Uh, it was it was a fun race, man. Just a crazy, crazy, crazy day, really. And then you got to do something, David, that you really don't see happen a lot anymore. You got to fill in with your teammate, CJ McLaughlin, after he had some issues with heat exhaustion. Tell us a little bit about that and getting to log some laps in the 66. Yeah, you know, uh, after I hit the wall, I drove it back down pit road and, the, and my team, uh, you know, Johnny Root, and they were looking at everything and thought we were going to be able to, you know, maybe – put a lot of tape on it, cut some stuff off and keep continue. But, uh, but unfortunately our right front spindle had, our spindle had broken, it broke. And uh, so I pulled behind pit, uh, pit road wall. And uh, when they, they looked at the damage a little more and they said, Hey David, we're not going to be able to continue. So man, I got out of it. NASCAR was there and they said, Hey David, you need to go over to the infield care center. So I went to the infield care center. That's kind of our protocol in NASCAR. If, uh, if you're involved in an accident, uh, you have to go to the infield care center. So I went there and did that procedure, got back to the garage area, was in my uh, in our race hauler. I was taking my Whataburger uniform off. And uh, next thing you know, Carl Long was up there and said, hey, man, we sure need you to get in that 66 car. I'm like, what's going on? He said, well, the, uh, the AC system in that car wasn't working right. And CJ, the, uh, the driver, CJ McLaughlin, uh, he, he had uh, overheated a little bit, and that was easy to do because man, it was pretty humid, pretty hot, and without that AC blowing on him, uh, you know, it was, uh, I think he did the right thing by pulling in and jumping out. So, man, I, I was able to jump in that 66 car. Uh, it was a Ford and run the last, I think, 70 laps. And, man, how, I couldn't believe how good that car was. I mean, I jumped in that car. And I believe it was several laps down because they had a plug wire that, that had fallen off the spark plug and they lost several laps. But I, I was not aware of that. But when I once when I got in the race car and, man, we got to running, man, that thing was fast. I mean, we passed 17, 18 race cars. And after the race was over with, I was talking to Carl Long and, and the crew chiefs. And uh, they said, hey, man, you're passing cars that we shouldn't have been passing. I mean, we had some good race cars Saturday. It's just unfortunate that CJ and myself, our, our finish results doesn't reflect that. You know what I mean? But, man, I was excited that we had good race cars. And that's all you can ask for is a good handling race car. But, man, what a, what a, what a day. You know, I was madder than hell at myself. I mean, you know, you're not supposed to – you're going to wreck. Why don't you wreck in the corners? You know what I mean? Not going straight. You know what I mean? So I kind of look at myself and – I don't have anybody to blame but myself, you know. And uh, but anyway, what a what an emotional roller coaster day. But I was glad to be able to finish up the race in the '66 and talk about, you know, uh, compare a Toyota Supra against a Ford product that we out we had out there. And I think being able to drive both their cars on in the same race really uh, really gave us a little bit of some knowledge moving forward. So it was a very interesting day, you know what I mean? Sure, Dave. And the other thing, too, like you said, hitting the wall there on the front stretch. Remember Joe Nemechek saying years ago, and I'm paraphrasing, but 
when he would crash in the corner on the outside retaining wall, he would say it was similar to getting like punched in the face, like a really bad jab. The way you hit the, the front stretch wall, is there anything you could compare that to? Like maybe the everyday person would be like, oh yeah, I know what that would kind of feel like. Is there anything that, that immediately comes to mind? Man, uh, not really. I mean, you know, <laughs> I just, there's nothing fun about wrecking. I hate, you know, it's part of what we do. When you do this as long as we've done it, that kind of stuff's going to happen. You know, you just try to keep it to a minimum because, man, we're all competitive. We want to win and want to do the best we can do when you're wrecking. You know, first of all, you can't make your race cars better if they're all tore up. And the second thing, you know, you, you're not getting your sponsor any coverage when you're in the garage or in the garage and not on the racetrack. Uh, it's hard to compare what that feels like. It was just uh, – you know, when you hit the wall as hard as I hit it, only thing I'm thinking, man, I hope we're not damaging the front suspension so I can continue on, you know what I mean? And once we figured out that it was damaged to the point where you couldn't race it anymore, and you go in the infield care center and, uh, you know, they run through all their procedures and they're checking your body out and checking your pulse and your heart rate and, you know, your, your, your uh, oxygen level. And, you know, they said, hey, Mr. Starr is, uh, you know, do you, you, do you hurt anywhere? I said, well, hey, you know, I, I'm good, but do you have anything for hurt feelings? You know what I mean? Because my feelings were hurt, you know what I mean? And they, they got a good laugh out of that, and off I went, you know. And uh, so anyway, it's just uh, – it's, it's a feeling. It's a horrible feeling, you know, because, right. man, you want you want to you race and do the best you can. You don't – I never go to a race think I'm going to wreck, but it's just you do it long enough like we have, and it's going to happen. It's part of what we do, you know. David, have you ever changed manufacturers in the middle of a race before? <laughs> Man, I never have. You know, it's been a while. I was just thinking about that, you know, uh, after the race was over with, you know. And, uh, you know, thank God I never had because you don't want to start a race on one manufacturer and jump to another one because there's a lot of circumstances involved in that. You know what I mean? And uh, so I'm glad to say that I, I don't think I've ever – I have done it in the past – but I don't believe I've jumped out of one manufacturer into a different one. You know what I mean? So that was kind of a first. But it was good to, to feel the difference in, in, the, in the downforce level, the handling of the race car, and, and feel the difference in the, in the underneath the hood, in the engine, you know. So uh, I, I, uh, you know, I, I talked to both crew chiefs. We had a little meeting after the race was over with, and I think it's going to help our, our competition, our overall – performance at Carl Long Motorsports, you know what I mean? And, and uh, un, un, during a, un, uh, un, uh, you know, during something that was, that was bad, you know, something positive came out of, and I think it'll help us in the future. So yeah, it wasn't too bad. Now the, the Xfinity race itself that you were a part of there, Kyle Busch wins in what many people believe was his final start. He says that he's not scheduled to race uh, for the rest of the year and for next year in the Xfinity Series. Goes five for five and uh, now has, correct me if I'm wrong here, Dominic, 102 career Xfinity wins. You are uh, correct. After, uh, after that one, uh, Do uh, David, you, you've raced against Kyle a lot. Uh, we know about what he's done in the Cup Series, you know, but the Xfinity run, we will never see anything like this ever again. How would you – uh, evaluate uh, Kyle Bush's Xfinity career and how it's gone over this, uh, what's been close to a 20 year stretch now. Man, I, you know, we, we're watching, you know, when you watch it on TV or you're on the racetrack with him, it's something, something special. You know, it's, it's greatness. Uh, his ability in a race car, you know, uh, his ability is, one of the all-time best, you know what I mean? I put him up there with a Richard Petty, A.J. Foyt, Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, Mario Andretti. I mean, just unbelievable, you know, just what he's done, and I'd say in a short period of time, is just we're watching greatness. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of people booing when they introduce him before the race starts, and I know – you know, his relationship with the fans hadn't always been the best. But whatever you think about Kyle Busch, however you think about him, one of the things I, I would say is you have to respect his ability. 
you know, and uh, man, the ability is, it's greatness, man. It's, it's, it's unbelievable what he's done. And, uh, you know, and I don't believe uh, Saturday's race, if he had, I don't believe he had the best race car there. I think his teammate was actually the class of the, of the field and, and might've been the guy that win the race. But, uh, but anyway, you put Kyle Busch in a Joe Gibbs racing car with a, a, a back by a Toyota and the best equipment, the best technology and the best people, Man, that's a recipe for greatness, man. And that's what we've been seeing over all these years. The guy's just unbelievable. Yeah, uh, no question about it. And uh, the, the ending there uh, with him getting involved with his teammate, Daniel Hemrick. Uh, David, what did you think from your vantage point there? Do you think Kyle did anything wrong with uh, with that exchange or was, was that just hard racing? Well, you know, I mean, we've seen it week in and week out and now. Uh, on the restarts, you know, you want your teammate to push you on the restart. And Atlanta, with the track being so wore out, on the restarts are treacherous for all of us because trying to hook up that hook up your rear tires on the restart is the challenge. So, you know, there in Atlanta, you don't get the kind of restarts that we get everywhere else, you know. So uh, to, to, to ease into the throttle, you know, is, is easy and as hard as you can you know, and to have your teammate push you, that's, you know, that's what you want, you know, so especially when you're in that front row, you want somebody to push you from behind. So you get, you get a little bit of uh, an advantage getting into turn one to be able to clear the guy on the outside. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, the way he got pushed, it didn't work out to his advantage, you know what I mean? And just, just the circumstances, just, Man, you know, and I, I think Kyle had good intentions from what I saw. Uh, I think when he did push him, it was a little bit late, uh, uh, late, you know, almost he was almost into the corner of, the, uh, of getting into turn one. But, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, they are teammates and Kyle Busch is one is, I mean, look at what we just talked about, 103, 102 wins and, uh his teammate, you know, I don't know how many wins he has, but it's not a whole lot. But I can't imagine Kyle Busch intentionally doing that. And uh, after seeing the replay and everything, I don't think it was intentional. You know what I mean? But everybody's going to have their own opinion. My opinion is it wasn't intentional. And and uh, you hate it. You hate it to see that happen because, uh, because you know, uh, Kyle, I don't believe Kyle would ever won the race. That wouldn't have happened. But, uh, but it is just racing, man. You just never know. And uh, anyway, and to hear, you know, I didn't hear Kyle Busch's uh, interview until the next day, I think in victory lane. He says, hey, it's hard to kind of cherish this moment when, you know, when, when that happened, you know what I mean? So, you know, I think he was humbled about it and he felt bad about it. But it's just racing sometimes, you know, uh, uh you know, I, I think the hit and the push of where when it happened, you know, it was a little late, but hey, it's you know, it's it's just hard to judge it all. You know, who knows if you're not in those shoes, you're not first and second, it's hard to really say. But I you know, my personal opinion, and I like to hear y'all's opinion, I don't think he did it on purpose. I don't either. And he echoed those statements Saturday, David, when they pulled him into the media center there at Atlanta Motor Speedway and he did his post race availability and he talked about it while the win was was cool in his final confirmed start. He definitely did express sorriness and kind of regretfulness of what happened on track there with Daniel Hammer. And he, I think he even said it best. He goes, this win doesn't benefit me, but the win would have benefited and gone a lot longer of a way there for Daniel Hammer compared to myself. No doubt about it, man. And I felt bad for uh, Daniel. And, uh, you know, I knew Kyle Bush did after I heard the interview. But what, what was your th thoughts, Tyler? Yeah, I don't think he did it intentionally. I do think Kyle was eager to get that win uh, to go out on top, but I don't think he intentionally tried to take out his teammate in the process. Uh, I would say, David, uh, to kind of wrap up Atlanta on this, uh, on the Xfinity side, uh, Daniel Hembrick, he's making some progress. I know he's in great equipment. We already know that, but his – day is coming. I know he's still looking for that first career win and won a NASCAR's top three series, but the way that he ran, I think the improvement is there. 
Daniel Hemrick, I think, is going to find a way to get into victory lane this year uh, sooner rather than later. That first career win is going to happen. Man, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, just to be driving for Joe Gibbs and, and uh, you know, uh, even though I'm out there racing with him, uh, it don't get much better than that, man. I mean, to drive a Joe Gibbs Toyota, to be partner with that organization, with the, the uh, technology and resources and the engineering, I mean, we – we see it at this Xfinity level, and you see it on Sundays a cup level. But uh, we'll see Daniel, Daniel Hemrick in victory lane uh, before the season's over, over with. You know, I would bet on that just because he's run so good, you know. And uh, and uh, and he's such a great guy. I want to see him win. You know, he's uh, – you know, he had opportunity to race in the Cup Series. I don't know if it was only for a year or two. A year. And, uh well, how many years was it, Tyler? It was one year for Richard Childress. Right. Yeah, you know, and I, I felt like, uh, you know, I felt like that was not an, you know, I felt bad for him, to be honest with you, because it put him in there and he was just starting to figure it out. And the next thing you know, he's out, you know what I mean, only after a year. And uh, I was glad to see him get an opportunity with a Joe Gibbs racing organization to, to show that, hey, I belong in the Cup Series and I'm a winner, so uh, I'm just – I'm glad for him. Again, like I said, he's a great guy. He's a great race car driver. So I think I think we're going to see Daniel Hemrick win some more races, uh, and I believe in the future we'll see him back in the Cup Series as well. I, I think so. David, you're right. He got the one year in Cup. He won the pole at Kansas in the fall of 19. He had a couple top ten finishes, including a fifth at Dega. But you look at the stats where he leads, right, in the Xfinity Series. Most top five finishes – without a win in Xfinity. I believe most runner-up finishes, certainly the most laps led among any driver in the competition that is yet to win, but all that is null and void when he wins, and I do believe we're going to see that this season. But as we move on to the next race in New Hampshire this upcoming week, and Dave, that's a track that's been historically good to you in the Xfinity Series with some strong runs and even stronger runs there in the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series. What's your outlook for Saturday's race? Man, I'm excited. You know, we heard Spencer talk about the PJ1 that they put on the racetrack, you know. And, uh, you know, before they started spraying that stuff on these racetracks, heck, we always ran really well there. And it's kind of interesting because the lane, the the lane, the fast groove around New Hampshire, you know, when they spray that PJ1 down, man, it's really the, the, the groove we run in turns one and two. It's about a lane and a half up, you know, and uh, – but it's cool, you know. It's it's a great race track. Uh, you really your race car's got to rotate in the center. I don't know, y'all hear me talk about rotation. I mean, you that thing's got to be able to turn in the center, and you got to get back to the gas as that thing's rotating, and have some great forward bite. But it's just been a great race track. It's so flat, man. You carry so much speed into the corners. It's easy to overdrive the race car a lot. And man, let me tell you, there's been some great battles there. I mean, because you can have a guy that's faster than you come down the front straightaway and you can squeeze him down. And man, when you squeeze somebody, I mean, that inside guy, he's, he's on edge, man. He's, he's about to spin out himself because he's on the brakes and he's turning the wheel hard. And, and next thing you know, but when you do that to somebody, if he spins out, he's probably going to take you with him. But, uh, but man, just a great racetrack, you know, with the PJ one on uh, that they're spraying on the track, it's going to make the racetrack even more racy. But man, you gotta have good horsepower. Hold on a gotta... second, David. Hold on a second. Uh, I, I gotta know. You know, uh, there's people like me out there are probably saying, David, what the hell is PJ one? Please explain that first. Put that in. Explain it to me like I'm five. What is PJ one? <laughs> well, you know, it's a chemical. It's kind of like taking a Coca Cola and 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 spraying it on 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 a, on a surface on the, on concrete or whatever and waiting about 30 minutes and it's real sticky you know what i mean if you walked over with your tennis shoes your tennis shoes almost stick to the coca cola you spray down so this pj1 is i don't you know it's some kind of tacky adhesive uh, that they've been using for the last couple of years at some of these racetracks we race at. And, man, our Goodyear Eagle radio racing tires, it's just sticky, man. And, and it's amazing that some of these racetracks you go to where they spray that stuff is a lane or a lane and a half up from where the traditional line is on a racetrack. And, I mean, you run in it and the grip level is unbelievable. You know what I mean? And I think it makes the racing better, you know. 
and uh, they did it at Phoenix International Raceway, and man, it was uh, it was unbelievable. They, they've done it at a lot of racetracks, and it really, I believe, makes the racing better, you know, but you do got to wear it in, and it is uh, sensitive to the temperature of whatever the temperature of the day is, and uh, you got to wear it in, so it, it is... Um, it's not perfect from the start, I can assure you that. If you get in at the wrong time, as good as it's grippy, sometimes it's really slippery as well. So, I mean, it's kind of, that was a little bit of, uh, of a challenge in there for the driver sometimes to know when to use it and when not to use it. But all in all, man, it's just tacky, it's grip. And uh, sometimes those different lanes that they spray it in, it really makes the race car a lot faster than the traditional line you would run. So it's uh, it's kind of a cool thing, you know, but challenging at the same time. Okay. Now I understand. I'll be thinking <laughs> of uh, Coke when, uh, when I see that. Uh, yeah. We will uh, transition and get to our uh, news and notes segment. But before we do, don't forget that every Whataburger is made fresh, served hot and prepared just like you like it. Want jalapenos and cheese on that? No problem. They've got you covered. Whataburger, proud to serve it hot and fresh 24 hours a day. Now, guys, I got to tell you, speaking of Whataburger, so I'm about to head to Phoenix uh, today, actually. And uh, I've already mapped out all the Whataburger locations close to my hotel. And you better believe there will be several trips to the Whataburger while I'm out in Phoenix. So. Oh, absolutely. And just like I was telling you guys before I get back, I've, I've had the pleasure of staying a few days hanging back on the East Coast after the Atlanta race and actually at Matt Corson and his fiance's place. So I appreciate them putting me up. But when I get back to Albuquerque later tonight, where's that first stop? Guys, I got to stop for fuel before I head back to Grant's. I got to <laughs> fill up at Whataburger. So that's where I'm going when I get off the airplane. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, what's kind of cool when we were at Atlanta Motor Speedway this weekend and got to visit with a lot of different fans and, you know, obviously they're from the Atlanta area and they're like, when does Waterburger come to Atlanta, Georgia? You know what I mean? It's, it's cool. The love and, and, and it's Waterburger Nation all over the United States, you know, but Waterburger is not in every state of the United States, you know, but it's, it's interesting that you go race at these different places where in their state, there is no water burger, but how how people are so, you know, how they know about water burger all over the United States and they can't wait to get one, you know, but I can assure you at lunch today that I had my number one and I had a good old chocolate shake and my Dr. Pepper. And it was unbelievable, man. I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I love my water burger. I'm, I'm, I could eat there every day and almost do, you know what I mean? I just, uh, I've always been a, yeah, they make the best hamburgers. I've been going since I was a little boy. And to have them part of our podcast and be able to have Whataburger on our race car, I mean, that's, that's just – I mean, you, you, I still pinch myself because I just can't believe it happens. You know what I mean? It's awesome, great man. We have. It's, it's great great. living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it really is. Like you said, David, you're a longtime eater of Whataburger. So are Tyler and I. So it's, it's amazing to have a part of this project. And uh, we'll continue eating plenty of Whataburger in the future. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, man. It's a good partnership for them because they get all our money back, uh, you know, when we, when we go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyways, news and notes. Kurt Busch, not Kyle, gets the win at Atlanta, outdueling his brother there at the finish. Dominic, uh, big day for Kurt. Uh, there's a lot of ways to look at this. Not only beating his brother, but clearly Ganassi's not backing down, even with, uh, you know, selling uh, and everything to, to track house. Ganassi's still competing at a high level. I mean, there's a lot to dissect from last Sunday's win for Kurt Busch there. Oh, absolutely. Like I was, I was telling Dave and Tyler before we got started here, NASCAR pulled in the top 25 or the top 20 drivers and points and some other headliners before the NASCAR race on Sunday to the Atlanta Motor Speedway Media Center. And Kurt Busch did a media availability and kind of like pre-pandemic, right? You go up to a driver, you ask him questions and there's reporters gathered around. I have to tell you guys, seeing Kurt Busch just sit in that chair in the media center, he just looked calm, cool and collected. And Matt and I were sitting there, part of the little media group. And Matt's like, so what's your outlook? And he's like, man, we're going to win today. And it's like, where's this confidence coming from? He just looks so relaxed. And he goes out and he led the most laps. That was the first time he's done that in several seasons, leading triple digit laps. His 33rd NASCAR Cup Series win. He passed Dale Jarrett on the wins list. And he's tied with Fireball Roberts for 25th all time on the NASCAR Cup Series all time wins list. The points races. But I asked him, too, guys, after the race. You guys know me. I love the history of the sport. I love the stats. 
And anytime a driver passes or ties a driver on the wins list, I love to ask them about it, get their perspective. Did they know the guy? Do they have any thoughts or any prior stories? And, and I asked him, I said, what are your thoughts on passing Dale Jarrett on the wins list and tying Fireball Roberts? And he sat back for a minute. He got a little, a little emotional about it. He's like, wow. He goes, that, that shows that the Bush brothers are entering some really great territory as far as NASCAR names in this sport. And it was just really cool to see him put it in perspective. Like, wow, th this is a really big win. And he didn't say it was as big as his Daytona 500 win or his Las Vegas win, but a very big one, especially knowing this is the last year for Chip Ganassi racing. So, David, with that being said, uh, the dominance that he showed, remember, he's in Hendrick equipment, too. Um, do you think that Kirk can contend for the championship? Uh, do you think maybe they've turned a corner here that he's going to be uh, up there come playoff time? Well, you got you to realize you did say Kirk Bush, and if I – if my, my memory uh, serves me correctly, we are talking about a, a former NASCAR Cup Series champion. Mm -hmm. And uh, his ability behind as a race car driver, man, I, I watch him every week. I used to race with Kurt Busch years and years, long time ago. But, man, it's amazing what he did Sunday afternoon. And, you know, he's a competitive guy, you know. And uh, when you think about Chip Ganassi, and all their Indy, Indy car racing stuff, the road racing stuff. When I think about Chip Ganassi, I think of, of, of a winner, you know, a, a winning team. And uh, and by no means are they out of it, you know what I mean? And I think uh, Kurt Busch, I think he's got something to prove. And I think he wants to win another championship for Chip Ganassi. And I know Chip is probably doing everything he can with his organization and people and their manufacturer to, to make sure they're the guys that that can win the cup in 2021. So uh, not surprising. I mean, and like you were just saying, Tyler, I mean, that is Hendrick Motor, Hendrick Power underneath the hood. And, uh, you know, there's no telling what else is Hendrick's. You know, they might be sharing technology, uh, engineering. And, uh, man, you can't, you can't ever uh, not consider Kirk Busch and Chip Ganassi racing. I mean, I was – so impressed with how good they were and how good their race car was consistently all day long in the race, you know? So, uh, well, when you, you, when you're doing that well with the Hendrick equipment, you can't hide it. Eventually your satellite teams are going to come together too. And that's what we saw was the Hendrick dominance blended over and showed with that one team. And, and the other thing I would look at, uh, Dominic, I'll go to you on this is, you, you were talking about the historical th side of things. I know that Kurt's not done racing yet. and He's looking at his options for next year. But if he retired tomorrow, I think his legacy would be this. He has made every organization he's been at better. Roush, Penske, uh, you know, his uh, days at Phoenix Racing even, uh, Furniture Row, Stuart Haas, Ganassi, every team he has made better. Maybe he hasn't always contended for championships, but uh, he has uh, gone in there and, and, uh, and, and been great for those organizations uh, for, for what he's done with the race car there and, and, and helped out, been, been, a, been a team player. Absolutely, Tyler. You look at his journeyman career in the NASCAR Cup Series. He never stayed more than six years with a single organization. But you bring up a great point. Every team he went with, he contended for wins. He contended for top five finishes. Led a bunch of laps. I recall those Phoenix racing days, 2012, overdriving equipment and wrecking cars, but he pieced together a really well race at Sonoma and almost beat Clint Boyer straight up in inferior equipment, I might add, too. And they didn't get that first win at Furniture Row, or I should say second win, because Regan Smith scored that. But you're right, the Stuart Haas days, 2015, 2016. Kurt Busch has always been that constant. And you, you look at drivers of yesteryear, and he just reminds me of like a Ricky Rudd. Ricky Rudd and Kurt Busch are very similar, right? Top 10 in points year after year. You're always going to expect that one annual victory from each driver. And Kurt Busch has now won a race in each of the last eight seasons. But I find it fascinating. He has not had a multi-win season since 2015. I'm curious now if this will roll some of the momentum. He's won earlier this year, then compared to 2020. Will Kurt Busch get back to victory lane again in 2021? I feel like that arrow points towards yes. I think so. I think it does. Uh, now, as far as the finish of that race goes, David, 
Uh, we saw his teammate, Ross Chastain, kind of put a block on uh, Kyle Busch of some sorts. Kyle didn't like that. What say you? What do you make of what uh, what Ross did? I mean, he, he's a teammate. He was running behind. Do you think he was just kind of doing his job? Or, or what say you as far as what uh, Ross Chastain did there with uh, Kyle Busch at the end of the race? Well, you know, you, you know, Rouse is a competitor. He's a great race car driver. And, uh, you know, he, he has a, 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 a responsibility for the race car he's driving for Jip Ganassi. And he has a responsibility for his team members uh, and his sponsors. And I don't think uh, Ross Chastain was worried about what was happening behind him. I think he was racing hard in front of him. Uh, you know, so happened his car, what is his, if his car wasn't, as good as his teammates' cars, obviously. But, uh, but you know, I think it was just one of those racing things. I, I can't really see that maybe they were talking to him on the radio, telling him, hey, block, block, Kyle, you know, uh, Kyle Busch for your teammate. You know, I just, I don't know. It's hard. I'm always focused on the car I'm racing and trying to pass a car in front of me and not the race that's happening for the lead behind me. You know what I mean? So, you know, I think, uh, you know, probably when they got to him, uh, when they got to him, you know, uh, uh, Ross Chastain held his line running high. He was running high. And I think it put some dirty air. Yeah, it obviously created some dirty air for, for Kyle Busch. And uh, his car didn't drive the same there for those two or three, four laps, whatever it was. And, and uh, Kurt was able to uh, – Take, uh, take advantage of that. But, man, I just think it was just a racing thing. You know what I mean? I just can't – I can't believe that somebody would be so worried about the leaders and not about what they were doing. I, like I said, you know, if I'm running 15th or 18th and, you know, I'm trying to – you know, coming down into the race, I'm trying to pass the guy in front of me because every, every spot matters. You know, every position matters uh, for points and everything else. So, I don't know. I, you know, from what I've seen – uh, and what little I've heard about it, uh, you know, I, I can't think that Ross was blocking. You know what I mean? He, he was just running his line, and so happened the coincidence of it. That, that was the line that Kyle Busch was running, and, you know, it gave Kyle Busch some dirty air, and, and man, and, and definitely uh, Kurt Busch took advantage of that. But Kurt Busch was good all day long, you know what I mean? So, uh so anyway, my opinion of it is, Tyler and Dominic, is that, you know, he was just a, just a coincidence, you know, how it worked out, just coincidence that it was Ross and Kurt, you know, Kurt Bush's teammate, you know, but uh, I don't think he would, uh, he was looking in his mirror, they had a plan to block Kyle, you know, I just don't see that, you know what I mean, sure. because, you know, and what, what what's your thoughts on that, Tyler, I'm curious to hear what your opinion is on that. I, it's hard for me to think that it wasn't intentional. Uh, in fact, I would look at it this way, David, that, you know, hey, you know, Ross is, you know, he's right now campaigning for a job. Absolutely. And that made him look like a dang good teammate. Um, you know, some people might not like that, but that certainly looks attractive for team owners that, you know, he's got his guys back. And, and Dominic, I mean – I know he's not technically a rookie, but this feels like his de facto rookie season. Ross has actually raced pretty decent, if you think about it. Um, I think that he might draw some interest. He might find himself in a good ride next year, Dominic. I agree with you, Tyler. You look at his reputation in the garage area, he's known as an aggressive driver, kind of like that Kurt Busch style. He's going to get more out of the equipment than I think most guys will. And he started the year with the top 10 in Daytona, kind of quiet the next stretch of races, but he knocked off that second place finish at Nashville. Guys, I think that race was five more laps. We'd be talking about how Chastain and Bush are both in the playoffs together, but you're right. Kind of a team player move there when you look on it. And Kurt Bush, given his insight there in the media center after the race, he was telling all of us he was being a great teammate. And that's what a great teammate does. And one of the reporters, I want to say it was Nate Ryan of NBC Sports asked him, well, a move like that, would you expect that in the playoffs? And he goes, no, absolutely not. He goes, it's different right now because we're all on even footing. We're all trying to race for a playoff spot. And he goes, everything's circumstantial. But what Ross Chastain did with that potential block on Sunday was being a good teammate. And it sounds like Kurt would have done the same had the roles been reversed. Hmm. How about that? That's uh, that's fascinating to, uh, to hear those things. Uh, what else do we got, Dominic? Well, 
Matt Benedetto, driver of the number 21 Wood Brothers Ford Fusion, or Ford Mustang, rather, in the Cup Series. He's in his second year with the team. We all know he is looking for that win 100 with Wood Brothers Racing. He held a media availability earlier this week with reporters. And one of the questions that got brought up for Matt was, what are your 2022 plans? As of right now, those are in limbo. And as we know, Austin Sindrick is graduating to the Cup Series next season. That leaves the big question mark. And I think kind of even taking a step back and going back to the Kurt Busch, Ross Chastain thing, I feel like a lot of the free agency this season is going to lie with where Kurt Busch falls and the rest of the dominoes fall. What do you all think? How likely will Matt DiBenedetto be back with some sort of Penske affiliation next season? Um, David, I look at it with uh, – we know that Keselowski's gone – and, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, Kurt Busch isn't going to Penske. We know that relationship. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that whether it's the 21 or the two car, Matt DiBenedetto's in, in good position uh, to, to stay within that organization. I don't know which ride it is, but I, I would be shocked if Matt DiBenedetto's not in the two or the 21 next year. Man, Tyler, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, you know, Matt's ability, uh, what he does behind the wheel is, uh, you know, speaks for itself. Uh, but, you know, I think Matt is racing right now. He's, he's auditioning to make sure that the, that the people know, hey, I'm, I'm here to stay. You know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, having great runs like he had in Atlanta, you know, I know he's doing everything he can to put that Wood Brothers car back into victory lane to get the Wood Brothers or 100th win and, and solidify him a future in the sport, you know, with a great racing team. But, man, I'd, I'd be surprised if they, they you know, I, I'd be surprised if he wasn't in those two cars we're talking about, you know what I mean, because he's just done a phenomenal job. But, uh, but you know, I, I feel like he's racing his tail off and he's doing everything they can right now just to kind of a uh, little – to buy a little bit of insurance. You can pull that 21 car into victory lane, and, man, that's all the insurance you need right there. You know what I'm saying? So I, I believe Matt's going to be okay, but I feel like uh, he's trying to give himself a little bit of insurance, and if he can get back to victory lane, it's definitely going to solidify his future, no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, I think so. And uh, Dominic, I mean, you look at it, the, the free agents that are available out there, you know, we haven't even mentioned Eric Jones. Um, you have, uh, you know, some of these rides that are available out there. Uh, you know, 2311 wants to do a second team. We know that Trackhouse is looking for another driver too. Um, I mean, there's some quality rides and some quality candidates that I, I think we're going to find some answers to probably in the next couple of weeks. Absolutely. It makes you wonder, too, because you always see a few guys jump up to the Cup Series from Xfinity or even Truck to run for Rookie of the Year. So I, I'm, a name I had heard, maybe you guys have heard, too, Zane Smith was kind of in the fold there at CGR before the track house deal went in. So would a rookie come in potentially to the Cup Series next year and potentially maybe take a ride from a guy we're thinking of? Because there's only so many spots and there's a lot of quality guys. We know this is a performance based industry. Who's going to get snubbed? That's who I'm curious. I'm curious on some of these guys that might come up from the Xfinity Series. Yeah, and then you hear, uh, you know, Kelly Earnhardt Miller this past week say that, you know, they're looking at options of bringing Junior Motorsports to Cup potentially around 2023. David, I think the Cup Series, when it comes to drivers and ownership, we're about to see a significant change here within this next year or two with this uh, new – uh, new car coming up and, and just what the sport looks like. There's going to be some new faces everywhere in a, in a short amount of time, I think, David. Man, we're watching some big changes happen in our sport. I mean, this this year and the next year, there's some big changes. Ownership, uh, the race car, uh, you know, the race car is going to change. Uh, you know, there's some big changes happening. And uh, obviously these new team owners and the current team owners and uh, the, just for a team perspective, uh, you know, and people say, well, you know, what about this driver? You think this, think that, you know, and, and man, there's a lot of elements for an owner to choose a driver. And I think one of the biggest things that I keep hearing uh, is uh, the, their ability 
and then the second thing is, you know, who brings the sponsorship with them? You know what I'm saying? So that's also another key factor. You know, who has a sponsor behind them? Who can bring a sponsor with them? And, uh, you know, and then obviously you got to have a lots and lots of talent. So, uh, but man, Tyler, like you're talking about, man, we're seeing some huge changes in our industry and in our sport. And, uh, you know, I think every day from this point moving forward, we're all just, uh, you know, just watching the internet, looking, you know, watching the telecast and just looking for news because, you know, there's big news coming. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that, David. Uh, before we get to our Ask David segment, uh, stop by Whataburger for a hot, hearty breakfast any morning or late at night. They're serving up breakfast from 11 p.m. to 11 a.m. Proud to serve it hot and fresh, 24 hours a day. What a burger. All right, David, uh, let's go ahead and get to the mailbag. And uh, we have a question from Brooke on the email inbox uh, where you can hit us up. David Star Podcast at gmail.com. Also on Facebook, David Star Podcast and Twitter at Star Podcast. And Brooke wants to know, David, with New Hampshire coming up this weekend, are you a seafood guy? What's your favorite type of seafood? Well, man, you know, uh, anytime uh, I love seafood and, uh, you know, uh, one of my, my good partners that I have from Reading, Pennsylvania. Alarm Tech System, Missy and, uh, and and Rich Fix, man. When I when we race in Pocono, we race in Dover, Delaware, man. I get a man. They always have a good feast, man. We got crab and big old four pound lobsters, and man, <laughs> I love love seafood. I love lobster, uh, New England uh, clam chowder, uh, seafood gumbo, man. I'm golly, I love it all. But man, that you can't beat a you can't be a four, a three or four pound lobster, that's for sure. So uh, when I head up to New England, uh, into New Hampshire this weekend, I can assure you, it's kind of like when I'm back at home or, uh, you know, racing around places where there's plenty of water burgers. When I go to New Hampshire, that's kind of uh, the seafood that kind of comes my water burger per se. You know what I mean? I got to have some good lobster, some good shrimp some good clam chowder. So uh, no doubt about it, man. I love seafood. You're speaking my language. Uh, I love me some lobster. I had a fresh <laughs> lobster when I went on vacation in Tampa a couple weeks ago. Oh, I could use that right now. What about you, Dominic? You like seafood? I love seafood, man. New Mexico has some really good seafood buffets at some of their casinos. And if the seafood Mexico, tastes Mexico, I don't believe that. Not New Mexico. <laughs> now, now, here's the thing, man. If seafood is tasting so good and it's been on a truck shipped from somewhere where it was fresh and it tastes that good in New Mexico, I want to try a seafood buffet actually on the East Coast or West Coast. <laughs> Not a bad idea. All right. Here's the uh, second email. This one comes from B. Uh, B wants to know, David, what's the best way to get rid of a sunburn after a NASCAR race weekend? <laughs> it was hot, wasn't it? Man, it was, it was hot, you know, and, uh, man, it was, uh, it was hot. Uh, man, I don't know. Uh, uh, I like being in the sun myself, you know, and, uh, uh, man, there's just a lot of sun tan oil and, uh. But, you know, I guess once you're not at a NASCAR race, you have the option to go inside your house or stay out of the sun, you know. And uh, so anyway, I don't know. I just, uh, you know, thank God people are coming to the races, getting sunburned. That means they're outside having a good time at the racetrack. <laughs> so that's a great thing. So we pre in at the racetrack, getting sunburned because we love our fans and our sport and they love being there. So, uh but anyway, I, I seen uh, I seen some sunburned people this weekend. That's for sure. And uh, I'll tell you, just cover up a little bit more, put a hat on, you know. Heck, but uh, yeah, I think they're okay once they get back home and uh, they're out of that 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 sun that's just uh, beaming down on everybody. But uh, it was a great weekend, no doubt about Wait, it. Did you get sunburned? No, they call it Hot Atlanta for a reason, but thankfully I was in an air-conditioned media center <laughs> for most of the race weekend. But no, no, thankfully no sunburn. I applied some sunscreen and I shot some photos for some of the races on Saturday and Sunday. So I tried to come prepared. So I, even though I'm browner on my skin, I still get a little perked up. I got I got red skin. I don't sunburn, so I can't help you. I don't know what to do with folks. Um, before we go, uh, let's give a name for uh, New Hampshire. Uh, a name to watch this weekend. Dominic, we'll start with you. 
New Hampshire, you can't go wrong with Brad Keselowski, Denny Hamlin. Those two duked it out last year in the cup race there. Kevin Harvick has always been solid there. I'm going to look for one of those three guys to win. But if we're going with one name, Brad Keselowski gets it done in New Hampshire. Uh, David, one name. Well, I, I want to say Martin Truex Jr. just because that's home to him. And, and uh, you know, I know that, you know, winning at his home track in New Hampshire is just it's kind of like – Denny Hamlin going to uh, Richmond, Virginia, wanting to win there. You know, everybody wants to win at their home track. And, uh, you know, Mark Truex Jr. has been good there over the years. And, uh, you know, I think uh, I think we see Martin Truex Jr. back in victory lane there at New Hampshire. Martin's a good one. Uh, what about Alex Bowman? We've talked so much about Kyle Larson's dominance with uh, the Heo you know, Hendrick bunch, but Alex Bowman's got three wins too. He's running really well. I think Alex is going to be a force to be reckoned with this weekend. Uh, guys, we got to go. Uh, how about Spencer? Man, we, we got to get him on a little longer. Uh, David, uh, what a guy, Spencer Boyd. We appreciate him joining us. Man, he's a, he's a great guy, man. He, I've known him for years. And, uh, you know, I like seeing somebody that has a lot of want to. Uh, he works hard. He's had some great partners. And, uh, you know, he's just a guy out there trying to make it in the sport. And I love seeing him in Victory Lane in Talladega. And I think it'd be a good partnership, him and Jimmy Means together. And uh, I'm hoping that Spencer Boyd has him a good run this weekend at Loud, New Hampshire. And he can add some more uh, Xfinity races to the rest of his schedule for uh, 2021. But, man, what a great guy. We, uh, you know, he was off doing something. And obviously, we, we, we had a lot more to talk to him about, but he uh, he could only visit with us for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it was. But uh, we'll have him on in the future to get more insight on, uh, you know, about Spencer's career. But a uh, good guy. Now, one of your, one of the star boys uh, popped up towards the end. <laughs> well, you know, when you're, when you're at home and, uh, you know, doing the podcast from – the house here. You never know if one of these star, uh, one of my boys are going to run, jump in with me. So he, uh, he wanted to come sit on my lap. So it's kind of cool that, that we can do that. Hopefully nobody minds little Nancy being right here and joining us. So it's all good. <laughs> I wish I could sit on your lap, David. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Whoa, <child. laughs> uh, oh, Dominic, uh, what's going on on the racing experts this week? We'll be covering remotely this weekend from New Hampshire Motor Speedway. But, no, we're not going to have anybody up there for us this time around. We've had some reporters up there in the past, but we'll continue to cover the sport from home. We'll continue to cover the sport over the two-week Olympic off week. And, David, I'm sure you're going to be looking forward to that one week off during that time as well for you. Absolutely, oh. man. Having a couple weekends off, you know, for your – you know, for your team, the people that work on the race cars that, that put their heart and soul into, into these race cars and having them get an opportunity to spend some time with their families, I think it's a great thing. So I, I'm glad to see that we're going to have two weekends off uh, just for uh, our team perspective. Uh, you know, it gives us a time as a racing team to catch up on some of our equipment and uh, repair some stuff and get stuff ready to, to make that run to the end of the season. And, uh, but, yeah, no doubt. But, I, man, I'm excited about this weekend. I'm excited about the cup stuff, man, because, man, the, you know, it's getting down to the wire. It's, uh, you know, you, you have Denny Hamlin or uh, Kevin Harvick win this weekend, and, man, it's, it's really going to make this point race and who makes the chase going to get more, even more interesting. You know what I mean? Have we ever seen a guy that's won a race – not make the playoffs. What happens if there's more than 16 that have won, won a race in the season? I mean, how does all that work? You know, five so races think... to go and potentially four spots up for grabs. Now, guys, if if we don't have another winner, I think the playoffs are set. If there's not another winner, these will be the 16. Uh, I don't see. I think there's too much of a gap between 16 to 17 right now, Don. You're right. I mean, it's over almost a two-point race lead. Tyler Reddick has pieced together arguably his best season in the Cup Series yet, 11 top 10 finishes, a bunch of top 6 to 10 finishes. But it's going to take, I think, somebody else outside of that top 20 group, maybe at Daytona. That's your big wild card. And I know we were big on saying early in the year, man, we're going to have 17 winners. It still could happen, but I think that's very unlikely. And I, I think a guy like Michael McDowell or Christopher Bell is probably very happy about that because they've been kind of yeah. hanging on to that cusp if that were to happen. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. We got to go. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash David Star Podcast, at Star Podcast on Twitter. 
and by email, podcast at gmail.com. Got to put the checkered flag out on this episode. For Spencer Boyd, David Starr, Dominic Oregon, I'm Zyla Jones. Sing so long. This has been another edition of Let's Go Racing. We'll see you next week.